Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. The U.S. Supreme Court could potentially hear the case involving comedian Bill Cosby as prosecutors in Pennsylvania are asking the Supreme Court to review the ruling from the PA Supreme Court that vacated the 84-year-old sexual assault convictions from back in 2018. We are looking at is some footage of Bill Cosby after he was released from prison back in June. He served about three years. His attorneys argue that he relied on a promise that he would never be prosecuted when he gave some damaging deposition testimony in a civil case involving the same victim, Andrea Constan, back in 2006. And the statements he made that were very incriminating were later used against him in his criminal trials. Now, prosecutors in Pennsylvania say that that ruling made by the PA Supreme Court could really set a dangerous precedent if convictions are overturned over closed-door deals. This was never a formal immunity agreement that was given to Bill Cosby. It was an oral promise or a handshake deal that he wouldn't be prosecuted. He relied on it to his detriment, gave testimony, albeit with a team of lawyers representing him. He sat there, and then fast-forward years later, a new DA is in town uh, that DA moves forward with the prosecution, uh, brought with him a team of attorneys who did an outstanding job on the case. I saw it firsthand. I watched the first trial unfold. I was in the courtroom for it and got to see those attorneys in action. One of them is with us right now on the program. He's outstanding. Trial attorney, former prosecutor in Montgomery County, Stuart Ryan. Okay, Stu, so what did you think when you heard this news that they're petitioning SCOTUS to hear this thing? Well, you know, I thought it was um, the right move. Uh, as the district attorney said in the in the brief submitted to the Supreme Court, as you just said, it sets a dangerous precedent. And you actually, we talked earlier about the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell case in a day or just a couple days after this Cosby decision came down, she actually cited it as a reason uh, for her, her own prosecution to be dismissed. And uh, what the district attorney's office is saying is that this concept that you can rely on a press release or the statement of a prosecutor that you are not going to be prosecuted right now to say that you are forever immunized from prosecution regardless of how uh, evidence may develop or new evidence may come in, that's a dangerous precedent for exactly that reason, that individuals may be able to rely on statements that are being made outside the courtroom, outside really the administration of criminal justice, just in terms of the function of the prosecutor uh, advising the public, his or her constituents as to what's going on about a case, that if, if accused individuals who become arrested uh, criminal defendants can rely on that and say, well, I thought I would never be prosecuted, it sets as the DA's office said, a dangerous precedent. Mm -hmm. And I know I told you this before, Stu, but this is such an important point that's worth revisiting right now as SCOTUS could potentially hear this case. And that is what the concurring and dissenting opinion said. And now I know you read all three. There was the majority opinion vacating the convictions, one that concurred in part and dissented in part, and then a totally dissenting opinion. And the one that, that said, look, we agree there was a constitutional violation, um, but we disagree with the remedy. Um, that's where I think this, this uh, petition has some teeth in that these justices uh, who concurred said, you know, look, there was a, a civil rights violation in using his words against him from that deposition. But the answer isn't throwing the baby out with the bathwater and putting him in a better position than he was before and saying no prosecution for you, Bill Cosby, because this happened and you relied on that immunity agreement that was never formalized. They say the remedy would be send it back to trial, but just don't allow the prosecutors to use that civil deposition testimony. Um, Stu, so two questions for you, the first of which is what do you think about the concurring and dissenting opinion here? Well, so I think first and foremost, somewhat to your point, um, in, in terms of what you were laying out about the about the opinion itself, it also contained language that the district attorney is now relying on in terms of petitioning the Supreme Court about really rebuking the conduct of the then district attorney in terms of if this promise was made making it in the first place. Now, I think where what you see in the concurring and dissenting opinion as well as the majority opinion and something that's not particularly in front of the Supreme Court right now, 
but does loom large in the background is really the deference that should be or was uh, in this case not shown to the trial court in the sense that the trial court who heard the testimony surrounding uh, this issue, who heard the testimony of the then district attorney in 2005, who heard the testimony of the other witnesses, Cosby's own lawyers, you know, lawyers for um, the the victim in the case, Andrea Constant, and determined actually that there there was no agreement, there was no promise, um, there was nothing of the sort, and and made a credibility determination along those lines um, that the superior court, the intermediate court, then relied on as is typical. Um, You know, though the concurring dissenting opinion and the majority opinion didn't rely on that credibility and that factual determination, um, and even though it's not exactly in front of the Supreme Court, I do think that it looms, like I said, very large in the background of the case. And depending upon how it shakes out with the Supreme Court sending it down, whether it's a remedies issue or, you know, uh, an aspect of of relying and showing the proper deference to the trial court, we'll just have, it'll it'll remain to be seen. Mm -hmm. Stu, when you and your colleagues, uh, one of whom, of course, uh, is the DA in Montgomery County, Kevin Steele, um, when you all were planning uh, your trying of this case and the pieces of evidence you would introduce. Was there ever a question as to whether or not to use that deposition testimony? Did you ever have any reluctance, I guess is what I'm asking, about using that piece of evidence? Because in my view, uh, the Commonwealth didn't need it. You all could have proven the case uh, without a doubt, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, I should say, without it. So, and to your point, the jury said that after the conviction in the in the second trial, um, they rightly, um, you know, applied the law to the facts and said, "Look, in this in this Commonwealth, uh, the credibility of the victim is paramount, and we believe we stand with Andrea Constand. We believe the words that she said to us, and we are unshaken by anything else we heard during the course." of the trial. So in that sense, um, I would agree with you, really the case rises and falls as sexual assault cases often do on the credibility and the testimony of of the victim in the case. As it relates to using the deposition uh, or not using the deposition, what we were relying on in in those circumstances was the, the, the trial court's decision that there had in fact not been any sort of promise or or quid pro quo or, or anything along those lines made between the then district attorney and Cosby um, such that, you know, he made that credibility determination and, and permitted the use of the deposition. So it wasn't so much a question about whether to use it or not, because there had been that credibility determination made by the trial judge who sat through the evidence, heard the then district attorney testify, determined, um, like I said, that it was it was not credible testimony. And so that was really what we were relying on, less so than than whether we um, needed it at the end of the day or not. And like I said before, we believed in Andre, and that's really what mattered. Right. No, I have absolutely. The Commonwealth did not need it. Andrea Constan was such a believable, authentic witness. And uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on something, too, for everyone wondering. The former DA, uh, his name is Bruce Castor, and we've seen him here on Court TV as he represented former President Donald Trump in his second impeachment trial. So if that name's familiar, it may be from that that our viewers might recognize the name. Um, Tell me, were you saying that he came before the trial judge in the Cosby case in one of the pretrial hearings to decide whether or not to suppress this evidence and gave testimony about it? Yeah, he did. It was actually the very first hearing that was in the case. Cosby was arrested in, um, I believe, December. Um, and then there was a hearing in, I think, the very beginning of February of, of the following calendar year, but just a couple months after that. The defense filed a motion saying that, look, this case should be dismissed. It shouldn't be heard because there had been this promise, this agreement. And it had taken different forms depending upon which um, version of the account of Mr. Castor you were looking at. Um, and all of that information, that evidence was presented um, to Judge Stephen O'Neill, who was the trial court judge. There was um, extensive direct testimony. There was extensive cross-examination. And what the judge did in that instance was make a credibility determination um, and state that he found that there was no such promise uh, or agreement that had ever been made. And it was merely an exercise of prosecutorial discretion, meaning that the district attorney at that time decided, look, based on the evidence, in my opinion, we're not going to prosecute this case right now. 
but it didn't act as anything binding on any future prosecutors. As is often the case, new evidence uh, arises, comes to the attention of law enforcement, investigations are made anew. Sure. And um, Stu, and from what I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but just, you know, what I've heard from some of the previous reporting that I had done on this case, and we're going back, you know, many years, I, I believe December of 2015 was when those charges were filed, just in the nick of time before the statute of limitations expired. Kevin Steele was the newly elected DA. He had um, largely ran on that promise to prosecute Bill Cosby as he served for years and years in your former office as an ADA in, in different units of the office. And it's my understanding that many people in your former office at the time this incident occurred, going back to 2004, I believe, if I'm right on the year, many at the time believed there was plenty of evidence to move forward with the prosecution and didn't agree with the ultimate decision that Bruce Castor made as the head of the office to say, no, we're not going forward now. Well, yeah, let me be clear. Uh, Kevin Steele um, actually didn't authorize the charges to be filed um, against the criminal defendant in this case. It was actually his predecessor. Um, and if you're interested, you can go and look at the criminal complaint. I saw you, I'm sure you saw plenty of those back in your days as a prosecutor. And right there on the front page is the signature of uh, District Attorney Risa Vetri Furman, who authorized um, the filing of that complaint. And I say that because she was actually the individual tasked in 2005 with uh, being the primary point person um, on the investigation, on whether, on rather the day to day aspects of the investigation. Um, and look, she didn't have the authority at that time. She was the first assistant, the second in command. It wasn't her decision to make. It did fall to the district attorney. I do remember a point during trial. Um, that was raised with actually the the lead detective from the local police department. It kind of goes to the question you had, which is where did things stand? And they had actually the detectives investigating the case, both from the county and from the local police department, had actually had a, an extensive meeting the day that charges were decided to be declined by way of this press release, had an extensive meeting about the different steps that they needed to take. They had actually written down uh, a rather substantial list of steps that they were going to take to further gather evidence in the case um, that was retained in the police file. We used it as a piece of evidence at trial. Um, and then just hours after that meeting, to the surprise of some of those detectives, uh, the decision was made not to prosecute. Wow. So, Stu, to be clear, and I've heard that name before, uh, I believe you said Risa Vetri, is that correct? Risa, Risa Vetri, Vetri Furman. Yep. Wasn't she the, the head of the sex assault unit? Was she a deputy DA um, for some time in your former office? Because I, I know I've heard her name. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here. Was she not someone who always from the outset wanted to proceed with charges against Bill Cosby? I can't speak for um, then DA Furman, now Judge Furman. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for her. She hired me. I know the sort of credentials she brings to these sorts of cases. Certainly she would be able to, to speak to whether or not she from the outset wanted to do this. I would imagine that the way she looked at it was um, like she looked at other cases, which is, okay, we have a complaint. Let's go through the investigation. Let's gather the evidence. What I do know is that she, to say seasoned, uh, which was a seasoned sex assault prosecutor, would be uh, a tremendous understatement. She was groundbreaking um, in terms of her work, not just in sexual assault cases generally, but for the children of Montgomery County, finding founding uh, the first child advocacy center where children, uh, victims of sexual assault can come forward. And so she had those bona fides, so to speak, when it relates to these sorts of cases. And then she was the one that ultimately uh, authorized the charges in 2015. Mm -hmm. And when you said she lacked the authority before, what changed between that time and then the time when she did authorize the filing? At the time of in 2005, when she was uh, you know, the primary investigator from the district attorney's office, she was the first assistant district attorney, meaning she was the second in command. Um, while she could certainly give advice to the elected DA, it's the choice and decision of the elected district attorney as to whether or not someone is charged with a crime. And in this case, the then elected district attorney, Mr. Castor, decided not to pursue charges. And then when it came to be her turn, uh, you know, then DA Risa Vetri Furman, uh, based on an evaluation of the evidence, determined that all uh, that charges, um, you know, were were warranted, and then authorized the filing of those charges.
Gotcha. Stuart Ryan, this is all so fascinating. I'm sure we're going to continue these conversations uh, more and more uh, as the weeks uh, roll on here with this big news. This is big, big breaking news uh, this week, and, and we'll see what happens. But thank you for sharing all of that uh, information from your experiences working on this case.